Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, I hope everything's going well with you at home. Uh, if Don't forget that if you're in my class, you're welcome to email me on the class email address. Um, it'd be really good to hear how you're getting on, even if it's just to say things are going fine. Uh, coming up, the next few chapters of The Parent Agency. So, chapter 11. Lady Rada Welloff pulled Barry hard towards a particular roulette table, around which was Jeremy, Teremy, Meremy, Heremy, Queremy, Smellamy, Sea an Enemy, and Dave. Hello, everyone, she said. Can I leave Barrington with you? They all looked up. No one said anything. Super, said Lady Rada Welloff, and disappeared into the crowd. Barry sat down, in between Jeremy and Teremy. There was hardly any room, and they didn't move up much to let him in. Place your beds, please. Barry looked up. Peevish had appeared, and was now wearing a weird cap with a transparent green peak. With a smooth smile, the butler twisted the roulette wheel and set a little white ball spinning round its edge. Jeremy, Teremy, Meremy, Heremy, Queremy, Smellamy, Sea an Enemy, and Dave all started frantically placing their chips on the squares laid out on the long green table. Jeremy on red, Teremy on black, Meremy on odd, Heremy on even, Queremy on the first twelve, Smellamy on the middle twelve, see an enemy on the last twelve, and Dave on a corner of the table that just had a tiny bit of cheese stuck to it. No bets, your massive importance, said Peevish. Barry realised he was talking to him. I, I don't know where to put it. There they are on the roulette table. Peevish leant over and looked Barry closely in the eye. I think 23 is always a good bet, your bigness. And then he winked. I don't know, said Barry. I always like the number 19. Peevish sighed. No, your great silliness. 23. That's the best bet. Oh, said Barry. He looked at the ball spinning round the edges of the wheel, like a cyclist going round a velodrome at top speed. It started to fall down the ramp of the wheel, heading towards the numbers. Quickly, he picked up his million-pound chip, and, after a couple of seconds of frantically looking, where was it? Oh yes, there between 22 and 24. He put it down on 23. Peevish, at that point, seemed to nod to himself, and... Barry wasn't sure, but he thought he might just have pressed something under the table. At any rate, the wheel stopped spinning very suddenly, and the little white ball bounced down from the edge, spun a bit on 24, but then settled snugly into 23. My goodness, said Peevish, there's a surprise. Um, how much have I won? said Barry. Peevish sprinkled a series of one million pound chips on the table and pushed them towards him with a little shovel. Thirty-six million pounds, your richness. Oh my God, said Barry. He was about to leap up and stick both hands in the air, like he'd just scored a goal. But then he noticed that all the other children were staring angrily at him. That's not fair, said Jeremy. You did it, Peevish, said Queremy. Then you child always wins, said Meremy. Wah, said Sea an Enemy. Hmm, this is a lovely piece of cheese, said Dave. Um, sorry, said Barry, not sure what to do. Peevish had appeared beside him with a small plastic bucket, like you get on a beach. For your chips, your chipfulness, he said, and ladled them in. Wah! continued Sea an Enemy. Look, I don't want to upset anyone, said Barry. Nonsense, Barrington, said Lord Rudderwellor, bursting through the crowd around the table. Jolly well done, and now, guns. Chapter 12 Barry was very excited on the way to the shooting range. He imagined it would be something like the ones he'd seen in various James Bond films. When James Bond practised his skills, a long indoor hall with, at the far end, a row of one-dimensional dummies with targets for faces. And, at the other end, would be somewhere you could shoot from with a selection of handguns. Walther PPK, Colt M1911, and some earmuffs for the noise. He was so excited, in fact, that he said, Are we nearly there yet? Twice on the way. He had time to say this, as it took a lot longer to get there than Barry had expected. Instead of the shooting range being, for example, 
in a secret chamber under the house, he and Lord Rada Wellorf and all the other children had got into another stretch limo, this time a stretch Range Rover, and Peevish started driving them out into the countryside. It wasn't all that comfortable a journey. His bucket of chips rattled against his leg all the way. Sea and Enemy was still crying, and all the others were looking at Barry as if they'd really prefer it if he wasn't there. But Barry didn't care. He couldn't wait to start aiming at those dummies. Bang! Take that, Goldfinger! Bang! In your face, strange Spanish man with a blonde wig from Sky's Fall! He even started thinking about some of the clever one-liners he might say after shooting them. Suck on that, dummy! Ha-ha, he thought, after he came up with that. By the time they arrived, it was starting to get dark. Peevish got out of the car and went over to the small shed. He walked in, flicked a switch. Lights flooded the area they were standing in, which turned out not to be a long hall with dummies, with target faces at one end, but a long, muddy field. Peevish came out of the shed, holding a bundle of greeny-brown anoraks and flat caps. Put those on, children, said Lord Rudderwellorf, who, Barry noticed, was already wearing similar gear. The children all did as they were told. Then Peevish returned, pushing a wheelbarrow stacked up with what appeared to be a number of enormously long black trumpets. He started handing them out to the children, one by one. What are these? said Barry when it was his turn. Guns, of course, said Lord Rudderwellorf. This model is our own personal family shotgun, the Rada Wellorf flintlock mechanism blunderbuss. Bessie for short. Goes off with quite a bang, though, so watch out. Peevish handed Barry one of the Bessies. Barry immediately fell over. It was literally the heaviest thing he'd ever held. Ha 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 ha, he heard one of the other children. It might have been Jeremy or Teremy, or even Meremy. Stay as he struggled to get up. Stupid Barrington's too weak to hold his own gun. I'm not. I just... Peevish, can you help me? Certainly your weakliness. Slipped. Barry managed, with help from Peevish, to stand back up. He put the gun to one side of him, leant on it, and tried to look relaxed and jaunty. May I just... your idiocy? said Peevish. Barry frowned. Peevish adjusted Barry's flat cap, which had ended up backwards on his head, so that it faced forward again. Thank you, Peevish, said Barry, wondering whether he should give him a chip from his bucket as a tip. But before he could do so, Lord Rada Wellorf bellowed, Right! Line up, everyone! The children, all of whom, apart from Barry, seemed to understand how to carry the Bessies so as not to fall over, lined up. Barry tried to make it look all right and perfectly normal that he was using his gun basically as a walking stick. Right, Peevish, shouted Lord Rada Wellorf. What's the target today? Peevish went back into the shed and came out again, holding not a dummy, not a cut-out figure of a man with a scar and a monocle who may have been in charge of a criminal organisation trying to take over the world, but a big silver platter with big silver dome on it. He walked in front of the line of children and said, Voila! which Barry thought was French for, here you are, and took a big silver dome off the big silver platter. Underneath was a large grey and white bird with beautiful yellow eyes and a black pointy beak. It looked terrified, shaking with fear. It flapped its wings trying to fly away, but Barry could see that its legs were held to the silver platter by a series of silver chains. Perfect! The grouse is so big and flappy! And shootable this time of year, eh, peevish? Whatever you say, sir. All right, you know the drill. Peevish put the silver dome back on top of the bird and walked about a hundred metres away from the line of children. Hoist! shouted Lord Rada Wellorf. All the children heaved their Bessies up onto the top of their chests, pointing forward. With a supreme effort, Barry did so too, though he thought his arms were going to break. Aim! shouted Lord Rada Wellorf. All the children moved their guns towards Peevish. Barry, every muscle straining, did so too. Now, remember, first shot goes to the new boy. What? said Barry, who had been very much hoping to pretend to shoot when the time came. Special treat, special privilege. Dad! said Jeremy, Teremy, Meremy. Oh, you know all of them. 
Stop complaining. It was the same for you when you arrived. If he misses, one of you can bag the bird. So, are you ready, young Barrington? Um, splendid. Let her go, peevish. With an extra flourish, the butler took off the silver dome again and expertly released the chains. The grouse flapped uncertainly, rising to just above Peevish's head. It looked like it had been held captive so long it didn't understand where it should go. Come on, Barrington, shouted Lord Rada well off. Go on, you stupid idiot. Shoot you, Burke. What are you doing? Kill it! All this from the other children. Barry didn't know what to do. He really, really, really didn't want to shoot a defenceless bird. So he said, I don't want to. I 